He's back. Um, I, I think it's okay now. Can you hear me okay? Yeah. 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 I was, uh, my Zoom thing I joined, I joined as well through a browser. So. Um, uh -huh. uh, this week I haven't done very much, but um, I was, I've just been continuing on, like trying to like get the EEGs to work by themselves. So like, I know like last week you'd said about, um, you'd use the notebook, which had like created like an EEG per, per slice or per window, whatever you want to call it. Right, and right. Yeah. Like, so it hadn't given you any better results. So like this week I changed it slightly and, um, I, I didn't do it per window, but I did it when the expert consensus changes. So like for one single EEG at the start of the EEG, you might have a window that has one prediction and then you might have like a group of five or six or whatever that have another prediction and then it might finish with a different one. So I changed it so as I would like just get like the middle window for each of the predictions. And with that, it gave me slightly better results. And then the other thing I've been um, doing. Sorry. So when you say you, um, so you always took the middle, but uh, or I didn't quite grasp. Um, you took a different slice when the thing changed based on, uh, or when the uh, expert consensus changed based on the offset when it changed. Yeah. So like at the minute. So like Christy, for a single EEG, he only ever takes like one, one slice and he takes like the very middle slice between the right. minimum offset and the maximum offset. Even right. if that middle slice wasn't one of the predictions to start with, he just takes the middle bit. Right. So like what, what I'd done before was I'd taken between the minimum offset and the maximum offset but I took the median value, so mine was like the middle, but it was like on one of the offsets that was predicted by the votes. But yeah, like it meant that I only had like one one slice per EEG. Um, so like then I tried what, what you did last week, whereas I took like multiple slices, like I took a slice for every offset. But yeah, yeah like as you saw, like that didn't give any better results. So what I yeah, do now actually, is... I had done it, I think, for spectrograms, not for EGs. So I'm glad you tried it for EGs because I didn't gotten yet to um, try it. I think I tried it for the spectrograms. I have to go back and check. And EGs I hadn't done yet. But So you tried it for EGs, not for spectrograms. Yes, I, I'm just working with EEGs, not spectro spectrograms. Um, yeah, so I, I didn't think it gave me a better result. So like what I changed to was um, while the expert consensus stays the same, then I'll take the minimum and maximum over the, over the, like the slices where the expert consensus is the same. So, for example, at the start of like an EEG, you, you may have like three, three windows, and like those three windows might have exactly the same expert consensus. So, like what I would do there would be I would take the minimum, and maximum, and then take the median again, and then if there's other if the consensus changes during the EEG, then I do the same again. So yeah, like it means for each EEG, I may have like. Yeah, like a, a few different um, windows. So, like, it means that, um, yeah, like in the Chris Diot thing, one EEG may have, like, at the start of it, it may have the expert consensus says one thing, and then at the end of the EEG, the expert consensus may change to say say a different thing. Mm -hmm. But because of, because of the fact he just like averages over everything, it right. means that. Um, yeah, like your model may get a bit confused. Yeah, you have to land between the, or you have to somehow guess between the averages of those two situations, right? Like you, your model somehow has to figure out when this happens, which way do I go? 
or what fraction do I assign to the two, uh, to the various consensus changes, if you will. Yeah, so like if you take the extreme case, if, if you take maybe half of the start of the EEG, all the windows say one prediction, and then the second half of the EEG, all the predictions say a different prediction, but because of the fact he just averages over the whole thing, then like it may be that your model doesn't know what it is because of the fact that like it's averaged over the both and like it may end up you have like votes which are just in the middle for everything. Whereas right. what I where I, what I've done is yeah like I in that case I would take I would take two slices <laughs> one from the start of the EEG and one from the end of the EEG, and so yeah like it means that my it means yeah, like I'm not sort of averaging over different votes or whatever. When when the votes are one thing or the other, I'll have a different window, and it it did seem right. to give me better results. Ah, okay, so that's a good uh, thing to try. I might even try it with the infrastructure I have on the spectrograms first. Yeah, no, like it it, it should. Easier. Yeah, it should apply to spectrograms as well. And then the other thing I've been working on was yeah, like just applying like at the minute in yeah so like i've been using like that 1d cnn notebook i haven't got on to his more advanced one yet but within it i like i think within chris diot's one as well they apply like a low pass filter on the eegs or like at 20 hertz but there's no like yeah. high pass filter so i've been working so if i apply like a high pass filter just at 0.5 i think it is something like that it gives me slightly better results as well. It, it, but again, but actually, this is this is all one, from EEG prediction. Uh, okay. One question for you though is, I haven't looked recently at uh, Chris Yard's code, but I thought when I glanced at it that he had, uh, unless he did it when he generated the data set, I haven't looked at that code, but somewhere when I uh, stared at his code, I thought I saw that he was, you know, while he had set it up, he wasn't using it, or is it just my confusion? And he was actually using a low pass filter when he generated the uh, EG data. He he mightn't be using anything at all. I know, like in his code, he's got like a a denoise function, which is uh, right. not turned on. So, like, I think he's maybe right. just using the raw EG with no filter at all. Right. To make the spectrograms, um, but yeah, like certainly the bloke who is do using like the one D CNNs just on the EEGs, mm -hmm. he mm -hmm. uses yeah like a twenty hertz low pass filter. Okay, yeah, he does use a bunch of filters and a bunch of other things as well, um, and I had a whole lot of questions on that notebook is. I mean, of course, the 2D version, but I think you know, I haven't looked at the 1D version. So if you have uh, looked at it, I'd like to kind of let me see whether I can share that and we can go over some of the questions I have as to what he was doing, not necessarily... Um, <clears throat> You know, it's like more. I just wanted to kind of <clears throat> excuse me, understand the notebook somewhat <clears throat> before I proceed it to kind of copy slash implement it. Um, the first thing I had, and this is more like a knowledge. Can you see the notebook now? Um, I, I can, but yeah, I haven't looked at this notebook at all. Oh, okay. Um, but you know, some of it maybe he does it even in the. I'm assuming he kind of keeps the structure the same and just goes from 1D to 2D. So um, hopefully some of them are <clears throat> similar. But um, the question I, I was just too lazy. Maybe you know it off the top of your head, your mind. Um, do you know whether efficient net B0 versus this PF efficient net are different models? I assume so, right? I mean, sorry, um, what was that? I know there was this. There's, you know, he uses a backbone model of TF efficient net B0. 
you see the yeah. the tf in the front and yeah. i was just wondering whether that is different than the standard efficient net dbo i know that within yeah like the tim library or whatever he's got like pytorch versions of efficient net and he's got tensorflow efficient, efficient net so this here's just using the tensorflow efficient net it's the same model but just written for tensorflow but then he isn't using tensorflow here as i can tell you he uses like not lightning i'm not sure then does it does it use so that that's value that's curious okay i'll i'll go look at the same stuff i just was wondering whether any you um, might knew that of. so can you search for backbone 2d to see where it's used yeah it's used in his model that he uses for like the mcg megnet yeah. and pick that backbone to the thin create model oh by the um, way uh, one thing sorry go ahead finish yeah as i say like i thought that the tim library had pytorch versions of things and tensorflow versions of things and i i thought that was a tensorflow efficient net but as you say like not sure why it would be used in pytorch though yeah because he does use it in i mean all this is eventually pytorch code so or yeah. uh, ends up using pytorch anyway so that's why but anyway i'll go look it up i just was wondering if anybody i'll go look it up in notes in pen but i just i was just curious whether anybody knew it off the top of their head what was going on there um by the way the one other tidbit that i followed up on which is kind of interesting since we are on the topic and uh, i can actually use some yes he uses pytorch lightning so he's using pytorch but then using the tf model so anyway yeah. i'll figure that one uh let's go to the next uh sorry the, this thing is something i wanted to kind of uh, point out I don't know whether you folks are already familiar when it apparently been in use for a long time I just was oblivious to it and I was like what I don't know this um are you folks already familiar with what drop path rate is and what it does um no yeah and I was in either I was like wow I've never seen that and then I went in apparently there is a paper in 2016 on it and what that does is it actually drops an entire layer instead of dropping some uh you know drop rate is it just you drop some nodes in the network right and then drop path rate when you give that it actually changes the depth of the network so it's like stochastic depth varying network there's even a paper on this. so for example so that i thought that was fascinating because i had never seen that before so let me show you i thought that was pretty fascinating because i was like wow i've never seen um and then you know this stochastic depth drop path in pytorch what um this is a paper um yeah fractal net ultra deep neural network without residue so just fyi it kind of is a fascinating thing where we just drop uh randomly dropping operands of the join layer and something interesting i'd never seen that before i was just wondering whether i was just the guy who was like not familiar and i didn't seen it before but apparently it it's been in use things yeah see the paper is from 2016 i'd never seen it used 
anywhere else. So that's fascinating in itself. Um, the other thing, and this may be something you know, Steve already is: does he also use in spectrograms the MIDI? In the EEGs, he does use the MIDI as well as in the raw EEGs when he generates the 10,000 by 8. But I couldn't quite tell whether he does the same thing in spectrograms as well. I'm not sure, but like, um, where does he get his spectrograms from? Does he get his spectrograms from like Christy Alt stuff? He just, he just uses the preloaded spectrograms, he says, and there isn't a spectrogram stuff because it's easy to generate because these are the EGs that Chris Leon generated. So I know that that's the middle. And I can tell here he does use the middle for the raw EGs when he does the 10,008 raw EGs. That also is the middle. But because he doesn't do it in this notebook and just preloads the spectrogram, I wasn't sure. So I was just wondering whether in the 1D case you knew or um, well, in the one DK share, yeah, like, what well, he's only using the EEGs and the EEGs he uses, or yeah, it's just Christy Arts ones. So it's just middle uh, okay. ones. He doesn't use uh, spectrograms in the one D one D case. No, the one D is just purely EEGs. So here he brings in. So here you can see that when he does the raw, then he's using the middle right because this. Yeah. So, um, yeah. So that code exists here, and so I can clearly see, and even the E D stuff because he's using Chris Diots. I understand it's the middle, but this part um, is not clear because he just loads the stuff. Um, anyway. Um, the the other oh you said he just uses ed so maybe the other parts of the questions that i have um may not be if you haven't gone through the notebook then you wouldn't know but um you know in the eg mega net where he combines some of these things um Kind of reshapes the input uh, function. Yeah, see, he says here reshaping the input from 128 to 58 to 512 by 512 by 3. And I can kind of understand, I guess I'll just have to work through it and kind of print the shapes and stuff. Because I can kind of understand how you get from here to here, because basically you take uh, four of these and this becomes y12, and the remaining two of these, and you multiply that and it becomes y12, and then you're left with one, so it'll become y12, y12, one, and then you do xxx to make it y12, y12, three. But um, what confuses me about the way he does it, forgetting the details is, let's say the spec that he gets, right? Let's assume that that is just the first four layers are from spectrograms and the next are four layers are from EG, right? So that's how you get uh, input spec is 128 by 256 by eight with whatever um, you know, batch size. So it's batch size, then 128, 256, and then four for spectrograms, and then the remaining four, the latter four, for EDs, okay? So given that, you get the spectrograms, so Torch got cat spectrograms along in one, EDs, you do the same, but then, what he does here is what confuses me. Then he makes the spec equal to the spectrograms. And that's the part that then confuses me because at that part, 
at that point, wouldn't he use the EGs? Because the EGs are where he has done this, and wouldn't the spec have to combine these? I mean, he's only taking the first four if he makes spec equals spectrograms. You see what I'm asking? Just by looking at the code. <clears throat> Um, yeah, so like the first line, the first line there with the for loop. Yeah, like he's combined the the spectrograms, and then he's like, uh, he's concatenated them, isn't it? Yeah, he's concatenated the four layers or channels of spectrograms by doing yep. this. And he does the same thing for the EGs. So I get that. But then he ignores this EGs and he just makes the spec spectrograms and then the spec, he concatenates it as XXX. But if you are actually going to be combining oh, these, I see what you're saying, yeah. So he doesn't use the EEGs after making them? Exactly, yeah. That's the um, part that confuses me. Because he's just yeah. using the spec. He's ignoring the... Uh, he's just using the spectrum. He's ignoring the EEGs. Yep. Um, yeah. At least Certainly from the code, that. that's what I can tell, right? Um. As I say, I haven't looked at this notebook, but yeah, is this the bit of the code where he's trying to use the EEGs? Because... Well, I mean, because eventually this is the code where, you know, uh, now I have to again go through the details because he also does an RNN on the spec, which is, you know, as I said, the combination of the EGs and um, spectrograms. He, as you can see, he takes um, what X, what X, um, oh, um, X is the raw EG. So Think of this as the 10,000 by 8, and this spec is the combination of the EGs and the spectrograms. And so that's what this X and spec is. So X is the raw EG that's coming in from the tables, the 10,000 by 8, and this is the, uh, what do we see, 256 by 128 by 8. No, sorry, 128 by 256 by 8. Converted in the reshaped input thing to 512 by 512 by 3. It's done here. So that's what these two are. So this is where, for example, he's combining the raw EG data and the combination of the EG data and spectrogram data. But that's where I'm at a loss because he doesn't eventually combine it. He just uses this as the only the spectrogram data, according to at least this code. Yeah. I haven't run it. I just, as I said, I just wanted to kind of go through the code and figure out certain things for myself before I just ran it. Um, at least get a basic understanding of what he was doing and stuff. And this part really threw me. Uh, yeah, no, like you know, the rest of it is... Looks as if it's not being used. Yeah, at least from this part of the code, right? And he does use, he does use spec is self.reshape input spec. At yeah. which point, it's just the spectrograms based on this code. Like, what are you doing? And then for some reason, which I'm yet to also figure out, he uses two. Um, I don't know whether that's. Um, 
but anyway. Uh, and then, of course, it uses an RNA and the rest of it, you know, uh, and then eventually it spits out like five outputs, if you will. Um, and, you know, results, and then new out, spec, and then out 1D, out 2D. You can kind of figure out the shapes of these from this code and the fact that the last layers are all linear but I still have to work through some of these details to figure out. Um, but the reshape input function as I was going through it, just kind of like to me doing, what are you doing? And at least as far as I could tell, the result is, you know, whatever, uh, let's forget about the first axis or the first uh, dimension. The second dimension is the number of two, then it's two by six values, which are the six classes. Uh, the new out and the spec, interestingly, are whatever, the or whatever the first dimension, and then the second dimension is 128 for these two. And then out 1D and out 2D are again, uh, whatever the first dimension is, and then by six and by six. So these three, the result and the out 1D and out 2D are dimensions of number of classes and the new out and spec are 128. And you can see that he, in fact, he checks out I mean, just give me an idea of what some of the shapes are. And you can see that he checks out uh, the EG Meganet using these some randomly generated values. But you can see that the input, that's why I said that the, um, we call it IoT, but basically this is the X input um, that goes into the Meganet. And that's essentially um, num channels, config dot num channels, and um, by which is eight, config dot num channels is eight. So it's two eight by 10,000. And so that's why I said that this input is the raw EEG data. You can take, you can see it takes the middle 10,000 and eight channels, the eight which Chris Riot has also chosen, right? The banana eight. And then the spec is basically what we saw, which is 128 by 256 by eight. And then all the reshaping and stuff happens inside of here, and then the outputs and output, which, as I mentioned, is two by six, to batch size by number of outputs. You know, and then the rest of it is. Album, uh, augmentation, blah, blah, blah. He does a bunch of augmentation, which is really cool. You can see shift, line flip, all that kind of stuff. And this is where he does the butter filter, low pass filter, the low pass filter, some MU law encoding, quantizing the data, blah, blah, blah. So anyway, if you have a chance and you end up using it, or, uh, it, the other thing that confused me was he also has a multitude of these EG data sets. So he has an EG data set here, and he has an EG data set here. Um, so I guess he uses each one to generate samples for each of them, I imagine. And then he has another EG data set here. Um, then applies the transforms, group select, force, then add, and then he does the training. So, you know, the and then this is where he actually does the training. So, I mean, I can kind of see how he, come. the point is to combine the three, Sources of data, EG, 
with spectrogram and then the raw EEG. And then obviously as these shows in the original star, um, by original stuff, I mean in the diagram here, that's where he does the contrastive loss. Um, so there's scale dim loss in each case. Look back at his original picture. Right. So um, there are three scale dim loss for each of the three individual pieces, EG spectrograms and raw EGs. And then for the difference, and I have to 100% confirm this, but I'm fairly certain that he does the difference between a um, couple of them, maybe the EEG pieces, and uses a contrastive cosine distance loss, minimizes that as well. I assume that's for the two EGs. I have to yet confirm that. I haven't gone through that part of the code in detail. E, right. Timber uses, yeah, see, they use losses. So um, I'm kind of most of the way through, but I just have to finish up a couple of questions I still have on and that ED spec thing kind of threw me, but I haven't run it. And in order to run it, like probably you figured out Steve, that they, you have to do it on, you know, you have to have the data and set up all the data and stuff. So I spent, I don't know, maybe a day or two <laughs> downloading the data from Kaggle. By the way, what do you do or how do you, uh, is there a BKM for doing that? Because just unzipping the data for me took like five hours. Is that the case for you or do you unzip uh, a different way or? Five hours? Yeah. What, what, what did you download it to? Um, I downloaded it to my um to google drive that's i mean the way i did Holly. it on the google drive which um which was pretty quick is what i have done is i have kind of um now i forgot how i did it but thankfully i it is there is a way by which you can mirror or you can create a i forget what they call shadow or mirror or something uh, folders on your pc to folders on google drive so when you do that, you can just, you know, like, so Google Drive shows up as a G drive on your, on my desktop PC. So I just downloaded the zip file from Kaggle onto my PC, and then I copied it over from my, wherever I had downloaded in my downloads to my uh, mirrored G drive. And that happened like, I don't know, within five minutes or 10 minutes or something like that. So that was really fast. But then it's a zip drive that's sitting, it's a zip folder that's sitting on my Google Drive. And I had to unzip it, right? That unzipping takes forever. What, within the Jupyter notebook? Uh, no. I unzip the data first within uh, on the Google Drive. All right, yeah, I don't do it there. Um, yeah, so like I got the data via, you know, like the Kaggle API or whatever to download the data. Mm -hmm. So I okay. used that and pulled it into the Jupyter notebook and then saved it onto Google Drive. So yeah, so like it's sitting on my Google Drive in, in zip format. Then I pull that zip format when I want to work with it. I pull that over into my Jupyter notebook. And then I unzip it within the Jupyter Notebook. And yeah, it takes a while. Like it takes 20 minutes or something. Oh, but, um, okay. So you but unzip the, every time you're using it? Making well, your yes. But um, the data like that's come from Kaggle contains all of the stuff. It contains everything. 
So it contains right. like the EEGs and it contains the right. spectrograms. Spectrogram. Whereas, yeah, like I tend to only be working with one or the other. And plus as well, yeah, like if you're working with like Chris Diot's EEGs, you're, you're using just the map plot, um, the, the NumPy file. Um, right. Yeah. Have so, you downloaded his NumPy files as well? Yeah. But, okay, so you have them stored in your Google Drive. Yeah. But as I said, like, um, because of the fact I'm now using several windows per EEG. So, yeah, so I pulled over the whole Kaggle thing, just looked at the their EEG data and reprocessed it, as I said before, to make several windows. And then I save that myself as, like, NumPy files. Okay. Which mean which means that like when I actually want to work with stuff, I only pull those NumPy files over. I don't pull the the whole Kaggle zip thing over because, as you say, it, well for me it took about twenty minutes to unzip the whole thing. But yeah, but if you, in your in your notebook, not yeah. Now if you Google. try and on okay. Google Drive unzips really really slow. Right, that's what. And in fact, you know, thankfully Google pointed out something too that when it when I unzipped it. And it was kind of like, wow, it's smart. Um, I, I didn't know it was able to tell me that, but I was pleasantly surprised. It said that when I was unzipping and because of the way that I had it set up, right, like my drive, my G drive is mapped onto my PC as well. So yeah. that, and that, that helps me in some ways because I work on Python programs, then all those files, get mirrored onto Google Drive. So I'm kind of protected in the sense that if something happens to my PC, those files automatically are saved on the Google Drive. Because that Google Drive, G Drive is, you know, I can pick and choose which files I want on my PC to be mirrored onto Google Drive. So that really helps me at times where, you know, something crashes and I have to lose something, I can have it on backed up on the Google Drive uh, all the time. But as you say, so uh, interestingly, back to the, so the, the thing came back and said, hey, your virus tool is interfering with my unzipping and making it really slow. So can you like exempt these files from virus checks? So I went back in and, um, you know, because that told me it was like, you know, a 10 RX size or something. I was like, oh my God, I'm going to die by the time all these unzip." But um, fortunately, after doing, after exempting, it came down, but it was still, like I said, about <laughs> a five-hour thing. And then, you know, the first time I tried it, my PC went to sleep and the whole thing died. I was like, oh, my God. So I had to kind of prevent power saving to be on and stuff. So I think, uh, but eventually I got all of it under. But I think from what you say, that's something I should note down that maybe the better route is not to unzip, but um, if in the future, now that I've unzipped, I guess I don't pay the 20, uh, whatever minutes penalty um, that you may be paying, but uh, in the future, I might want to do what you're doing, leave it zipped and then unzip in the Jupyter Notebook on uh, Colab. That might be a faster thing. Yeah, I think it's faster to pull it over, unzipped, and then zip it when you get it. Yeah. Unzip it when you get it. Yeah, unzip it when you get it. Then I have to do your G down copy trick within the Colab notebook. Uh, uh, Srinivasan, what was the in channel 2D? That was the 8 here in the EEG mega net. Yeah, so that's the eight um, nodes or, you know, the eight uh, EEG differential channels that give the banana, that are corresponding to the banana diagram that Chris Diot uses. Okay, so those okay. are the eight. Yeah. So eight, because, eight, eight uh, nodes. Yeah, I yeah. Uh, the thing to be careful about is it may be differential nodes, not uh, okay. difference between the nodes rather than the actual value of the nodes. It's that's, yeah. but that's where the eight comes from. 
the eight times 10, uh, the 10,000 is the duration, right? It's 50 seconds, so 200 samples per second, so 50 times 200, 10,000. And then the eight is the eight corresponding channels of the banana diagram um, that he uses for the raw uh, data. But by the way, Steve, that's where one thing which puzzled me is when he does this 2D stuff, it's clear that he would have to use eight or else the dimensions get screwed up when he tries to combine the EG and spectrogram and the raw EG, right? Because in order to have the losses and other things aligned, you can't like use 20 on one side. Well, maybe you could and reshape it, but I thought uh, since you mentioned that you may be using more than eight, maybe that works in the one dimensional case, but in the 2D case, isn't there a case, uh, wouldn't it be the case that you'd have to stick with eight or you think you can go more than that and then collapse the shape um, as you process? Th that's not what he does. He sticks to eight, but just, to, just curious. I just thought you could have whatever shape you want. Like, is he not, like, as you saw there, like when he sticks the spectrograms together, does he not join them together? And so, like, yeah, he's joining eight, but you could join whatever number you want. Yeah, I just, yeah, I have to dig into that, whether that's possible in the way he sticks them together. Yeah, like, obviously, you would want uh, an even number, so as you can... Yeah, like, is he sticking them together to make a single image? Well, actually, um, that's just the spectrogram and the EGs, but I was thinking about the raw EGs, because there you can go any... Because eventually, it just combines. And then, you know, I was quite impressed by the fact that this guy must have done a lot of experimentation or had gotten lucky, because to come up with this complex setup he has for the mega net, and then, you know, which has all kinds of RNN built into it, and then a an 1D rest net. And then the way he combines the losses too is kind of unique because it's classification loss, uh, and then, you know, loss one, loss two, contrastive loss, all multiplied by 0.5, in, which is what is this total loss. Um, so there's a lot of knobs here that, you know, you have to figure out in order to get the results he did. 0.41 for a single model. All three things going into it, the raw EG, the EG, and the spectrogram. So, you, when you uh, said you were doing, so you're using his 1D CNMs, and yeah, so I, that's what you're utilizing. Yeah, so I'm just using, at the minute, his 1D CNN, and at the minute, I'm still just using, like, the eight channels. Um, I was trying to sort of do what, like, Reckel was, like, suggesting last week and sort of having small tests as opposed to, like, training all the way through, and that's why I didn't increase the channels. Um, just trying to find out what the best sort of low pass and high pass values are and improve that and then yeah like I was gonna he's got some augmentation there I'm not sure how much he uses in this notebook he uses a lot does he actually he have it turned on yeah I think so well, the notebook I have of his yeah like he has the augmentation section but he only calls the validation bit of it which doesn't do anything Oh, okay. But in this case, I thought he does use um, most of it. All right, yeah. Actually, here, yeah. So here he's got augmentations equals to train. In his 1D CNN, he has both of those set to valid. I'm not sure about this functionality, but if you look at his get transforms function in his 1D notebook, yeah, mm. there. Yeah, so, you see, 
So valid does nothing. Yeah, valid does nothing. Yeah, it's always yeah. the case. But yeah. here, data clean, he does flip wave. And then, um, right? Um, yeah, see, here he does only flip wave, but then here he defines transforms to in clean. Yeah. That's not being used, though. Yeah, but then, you know, here he just uses that. Yeah. That's the only thing he does. And then, of course, here, nothing. Yep. Yeah, so the one I have, it doesn't do anything. He doesn't use any augmentation at all. Yeah, so I was going to play about with that to see how much better I can make the EEGs. And then, see, this is the thing. I still have to figure this part out because you can see that when you see when he generates this guy, this EG data set, which is probably for the spectrogram, you can see that there it's again different. Self dot spec data generation and spec is self dot transforms dot dot. I mean under double thunder and then the thunder on the spec where he does the transforms is here and there he does a flip. But I think he uses different transforms for different. Um, portions of the data. Well, is this for where he's doing like stuff on EEGs and stuff on spectrograms? Yeah. That's the part I have to work to figure out what he's doing for which part. I haven't done those things. That's why this notebook also is not something like I mean, you saw where you could just run it because he has the same EEG data set three times. But I think that's because he has to use it each time to generate the appropriate values and then combine them. But he has a code for each of it, but obviously you can't run it that way. I mean, you have to kind of generate some data, save that, generate, they use the EEG data set, generate it for EEG, generate it for spectrogram, blah, blah, blah. I think, but I'm, but maybe I'm wrong because in this case, he does the spectrograms and the EEG spectrograms, and this EEG is, I assume, with the raw EEG. So maybe just eventually you combine them. Single EEG data set, which is what I would imagine you have to do. But then you have to figure out what is the. And does he do it for each piece? Uh, quite a bit of questions to go through and all that out. If, because I just didn't want to get a grasp of what he's doing in the notebook before I said. Anyway, interesting. So if you go through it and things that are worth noting or calling out, let me know. I'll continue to, because in the background, I'm running some stuff, but last week, in fact, I was limited by schedule stuff, even just running a few uh, notebooks, eight up my 30 hours very quickly. So two days, I couldn't do anything. And then my submissions were gone too, by two eight. Yeah, that's why I just do all my stuff now on Cool Lab. Yeah, so I kind of said I have to bite the bullet as Steve already has and go over to collapse. So I'm just did it now and this weekend I will start using it. I only on yesterday afternoon is when my five hours ended. I have it unzipped and everything now. But twice without it it um but what is interesting, just another comment as I was playing around is um, with the various uh, models and way that people have generated uh, data and used it. Um, one thing I found very interesting is when you do not um, ratify the spectrogram, I'm just talking spectrograms now, not EEGs. So when you just use the base spectrogram data, 
And if you kind of use a ENET model, B0 or B1, or a ResNet, interestingly, cases where people have not stratified based on um, expert consensus, the score turns out to be better than if you were to stratify. So if you just did a group, um, and oh, uh, in fact, not even that. If you did not even group, you just kind of created holes of the data. You don't even stratify and you don't group on patients. So patients um, could end up, same patient data could end up in the test or in the validation, I should say, that are in train. But obviously, um, you know, it would be different um, EGs for sure, or different spectrograms for sure, not same, right? But I thought that was very interesting, that the scores for models trained on un stratified, ungrouped by patient ID trained on spectrograms consistently beat the models trained using grouping and using stratification. I thought it was very interesting. I don't know why that is. When you say beat them, you mean like on the public leaderboard? Yeah. All right. And not by, you know, like a point one. Like in one case, it'll be point four five. In another case, it'll be like, you know, point four seven. By clear point two or yeah. thereabouts difference. I thought it was very interesting, right? Because that is not what you would think. I mean, of course, Chris Beard already said why he doesn't stratify. He uses just grouping. But it's interesting that if you don't group, you end up with slightly better results than if you do group. You'd think that you'd get data leakage and your cross-validation scores would be better than they should be? Yeah, that's what I would think, right? So you're publicly about, but, you know, that's what I was... Therefore, in my head, going through, okay, so what is the bad thing that would happen if the, if the patient's uh, data showed up in both, uh, if the same patient showed up in training and in validation? Um, and the only thing I could think of is, well, I mean, that assumes that the same patient's EG is consistently the same, but that's not the case, right? So that's the only situation where a data leakage could happen, that it figures out that, oh, I've seen this patient, and this patient's classification is X, so I'm going to stick with that. But then the situation is like you saw that the same patient, different EG, there are enough cases where the classification is different, right? Mm, yeah, you'd have thought the same patient would have had a similar looking EEG, but I don't know. Yeah, so I thought that was an interesting counter to what I would have anticipated or expected. I just wanted to call that out. That's what I observed. On spectrogram, I don't know yet. I haven't done it on EG because the EG experiments are more costly, so I haven't done them yet. Anyway, uh, lots of stuff for sure. You can play around with these quite a bit, but it's interesting that people have gotten to point two eight and stuff. Uh, yeah, I haven't actually looked at the public leaderboard. Sorry, the public notebooks this week. Has anybody released another uh, notebook? That... Yeah, no, mostly mostly just ensembles of stuff. 
it's all ensemble ensemble of yeah. high scoring notebooks otherwise so that's at least as i checked last night i don't know i haven't checked this morning but as of last night my time late was mainly ensembling stuff to get to 0.37 there about by ensembling different models but nobody has anything fundamentally different. Anyway, Mank, you were able to try anything? Yeah, I was trying out with the efficient uh, B2 models with the Chris Diotti note notebooks. And so I was, yeah, experimenting the different versions of efficient nets there. I see. And did B2 give any better results than B0 or B1? Uh huh. No, right now, no. With the both the EEGs and spectrograms, I wasn't able to get some improved results there. But I need to try those. Uh, as Steve alluded to, uh, uh, those middle uh waves of uh that stuff. I need to try. Yeah, that. I think Steve's approach is a very smart one. It's really mm -hmm. well thought out. Like, you know, when it changes, use different. That I think is an excellent uh, data-driven approach, like that. Yes. So, how do you figure that out, uh, Steve? You just kind of see that if the prior, if the previous thing doesn't match, the next thing is that how how you figure that out in pandas, or you do something different. Yeah, no, I just do it in pandas. So yeah, so like just when it goes through, yeah, so like the rules of the original training CSV file, right, right, right. um, I just go through that, and like when the expert consensus changes, well, I record like the minimum value, and then when it changes, I record right. the maximum value. Right, right, and then again, just continue when that. Signal flips, then you restart the min max. Yep. Yeah, so for most EEGs, you do still just get like a single window. Single like, yeah, one. There's, yeah, yeah. There's a, there's a few of them which have the vote changing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a good idea because I did notice, like I shared very early on, that taking the middle, uh, and I don't. In fact, here's the other thing I'll play with and let you know probably next week. Where See, one thing I did do, and I did not pay attention to the expert uh, things changing, which is actually a smart thing that you did. But um, I was just looking at whether taking the MIDI leaves out any data for cases where you're still... Uh, the experts are still flagging something for the data. And you're leaving out the relevant uh, window, the 10 second window. And I did find some 3,000 odd cases where that's that's true. Now, what I did not know, or what I didn't, uh, you know, uh, where it would matter is what you have identified. Where it would matter is if the classification changes. Because the classification doesn't change then it doesn't matter that you don't have that data window included, right? But if the so I already had noticed that if you just did the middle, because there are certain EGs or spectrograms, I forget now, uh, I think it was spectrograms I did this for, that there are certain cases where, you know, the, all the mins start at zero, right? But the maxes um, or some of the slices are way skewed right word that means that you know the the uh, the window starts very late and if that is the case and you take the middle then you're going to miss out if there are five windows that all start towards the very end then by taking the middle because your start uh, your original start is zero then you miss out a bunch of those so i identified i think I'm speaking from memory, but I had a notebook where I 
just played around with that and figured out there was about 3,000 cases where that's the situation. But as you did, of those 3,000, the ones that matter to the classification are those where the expert consensus changes. I think that's really smart move. All right. Quite some ideas to go try out further. So. Cool. Yep. Thanks for joining. Anybody else have any other thoughts or? Yeah, I do think so. Hopefully, I'll get some more submissions done this week because I've not actually submitted anything on the EEG. I just been, I didn't want to really submit until it's yeah, decided. Thing, I mean, I've been submitting a bunch, but all of my scores are all low because I've been trying as you have. But you know, like, is there any method to get a single spectrogram or EEG or something to improve? Because eventually, I mean, confirming is. A known thing, and you can just ensemble and get your score better, but you have to kind of get your underlying raw score to be better, right? Yep. All right. Good deal. Thanks, everybody. Okay, cool. See you all next week. See you next week. Cheers. Bye. Cheers. Bye. Thanks, guys. Take care.